perfectly satisfied. Uh, notice that he uses the term uh, spirit. And for um, Kierkegaard, as in the um, Germanic sense of spirit, Geist generally, um, uh, this refers to the, uh, the inner creativity, the inner resources, uh, the inner needs of um, the human being. Um, it's used in if you like, in Hegel's sense of spirit, self-conscious existence that needs to come to its fulfillment. So um, uh, what we have then is a crisis of the spirit. Uh, what we have is a crisis of the spirit, uh, a self-consciousness is beginning to dawn and finding the inadequacy of a purely sensate kind of existence. There was a sociologist some 20 or 30 years ago, thing, I think it was Sorokin, who um, talked of the sensate culture. Now you can imagine what a sensate culture would be one that tries to be satisfied with all of the baubles that exist in shopping centres. Uh, I don't know if you've been down to Town Square, the new shopping centre on uh, Naperville Road in the Rice Lake area. Um, everybody in town is talking about Town Square. Um, it's just at the juncture of Naperville Road where Blanchard Street comes into it. Um, it's surrounded by buildings so that the stores are on the inside, as in an old European town square, you see. Well, my wife and I went out there the other Saturday and walked around, and we decided there wasn't a thing there that anybody really needed, <laughs> <laughs> apart from the Barnes & Noble bookstore, <laughs> <laughs> which is tremendous. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid it's going to put Toad Hall out of business. Uh, but, um, you know, things which nobody really needs. Yeah, because they're addressed to um, a sensate culture that, um, you know, loves these fine little things that you find in select stores, you know. Oh, well, the town square people know where they're located. I mean, that's an area of homes selling in the $300,000, $350,000 range. You know, see. It's not made for Wheaton College students. Um, but, um, all right, uh, that sort of sensate existence doesn't satisfy. Uh, do you get the biblical echo in all of this? You see. Um, so what, what happens is that this, um, this stage of the aesthetic gives way uh, because of that crisis of beginning uh, self-discovery, the beginnings of self-discovery, uh, it gives way to the ethical stage where a person decides he's going to settle down and accept adult responsibilities decides to marry and settle down, uh, decides to um, accept some civic responsibilities, running for the school board or whatever. But um, really this is simply um, a, a structured life in which one has some objective duties, acting, if you like, out of a sense of duty. Get who he's referring to? The Kantian existence. Acting out of a sense of duty, but without any deep moral anguish of decision, without a conscience that's filled with remorse. The Kantian never says, woe is me, I'm undone. Yes, but um, this ethical stage still isn't sufficient. It hasn't plumbed the depths of the human spirit. 
not even the moral depths. So it elicits, elicits a further crisis. Uh, the person experiences what he calls a sickness unto death. I wish I could die. It's not worth it all, you see. A crisis of spirit. Until there arises what he calls a teleological suspension of the ethical. Now, catch that phrase and let it run best. Um, catch the phrase. Uh, he's not talking about um, reverting to some immoral kind of existence. It's a teleological suspension of the ethical. You see, and in the Hegelian tradition, there is this sense of cosmic teleology. Kierkegaard is not talking cosmic teleology. Uh, Kierkegaard's talking of the inner teleology of the human spirit. You see, he's not Hegel blowing up the human spirit into the whole life of the cosmos. But he's looking at the individual human spirit, per se, in this crisis of the spirit. And he's discovering that um, uh, the, 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 the human spirit has a, an eros, a desire, a hunger and thirst. You see, that's the teleology of the medievals, remember. Uh, has, has a hunger and thirst, a desire, that simply that um, uh, ethical life of outward conformity to social institutions and structures doesn't satisfy. And so um, that sort of ethical stage is transcended with a view to, for the purpose of, that which will satisfy. And uh, hence the, uh, the transcendence to the religious stage. Um, faith comes out of that sickness under death. And you begin to see he's playing with Paul's imagery of death and resurrection to a new life. Well, um, the religious stage in that he distinguishes between two phases, um, religious A and religious B. Religious A is really little more than a continuation of the ethical. Uh, in that the, um, the institutions and structures in which you now invest yourself are religious institutions and structures. Uh, what the British call churchmanship. You see. Uh, but uh, it's religion B which really is the vital kind of spiritual life. Uh, that's where the crisis of the spirit is finally fulfilled, satisfied, completed. Uh, where one's self-consciousness before God is um, to the fore. So that in this religious self-consciousness, sin, one's own status before God becomes most real. And we're confronted with the incarnation of the eternal God. And the response is that passion which... Uh, we call faith, love. And he writes extensively about those two passions. Now, in the fact that he calls them passions, um, be careful to keep that term in its historical setting 
rather than in um, 20th century English idiom, let alone American idiom. In American idiom, I guess, the word passion uh, connotes the wildest of the X-rated movies. That's not Kierkegaard. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the term passion here is um, a reference, of course, to 18th century psychology, where um, Hume's discussion of the uh, psychological proclivities, the proclivities of the soul, as distinct from reason, are called passions. There are strong passions, there are weak passions. Passions are emotions, dispositions, attitudes. It's the non-cognitive dimension of the inner life of the human spirit. Uh, so um, I I the word passion is simply saying that uh, this is um, uh, out of the very heart of one's inner being that faith responds, that love embraces, so forth. And uh, what he's talking about, obviously, is um, genuine Christian faith in response to Jesus Christ. Um, one of the things which um, I think brings this uh, uh, sort of thing also into focus um, is a piece that he has that's not exactly on this topic, um, but related to it. Um, there is an edition of his book, The Present Age, uh, in um, the paperback series by Harper and Rowe, Harper Torch Books, uh, The Present Age. Uh, the title piece in that book, The Present Age, uh, the title piece is his um, indictment of the Enlightenment, where the emphasis is on um, the objective path. The objective path in which um, nobody would ever dream of a revolution, anything like that. Footnote. That was published in 1848. Now, if you know your European history, 1848 was the day of revolutions. <laughs> German, Italian, so forth. Um, but, um, after all, it's his satirical critique of the Enlightenment that's the significant thing. There's no passion. You're trying to make your decision step by step in objective ways. Nobody would ever have the passion that would be needed to start a revolution. You know, and he talks of um, a book that people take out when they go to court a lady. A book that is a phrase book for lovers. So out of this scholarly collection of romantic phrases, the Enlightenment person thumbs and finds something appropriate for the moment and recites it. No spontaneity of passion, <laughs> you see. Um, uh, talks of a treasure that's laying out on the ice, and there's nobody who has the passion to skate out and get it, <laughs> uh, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, what, what he's saying is that the, uh, the main springs of our life are in the inner spirit in that way. You see. Now, um, also in that same um, edition of the present age, there is a second article. A second article called The Difference Between a Genius and an Apostle. And whereas the first, the present age, is a critique of the Enlightenment,